Well, I'd just like to ask Mr. Rose a question. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist, he tells me. Now, when the, when the San Jose Mercury reported uh, cold fusion, did you believe it? <laughs> Do you think that is the test for uh, data analysis and drawing conclusions? There are statisticians, there are psychometricians, there are uh, researchers in California who give a totally different reading to the California data. I'm supposed to believe the San Jose Mercury? <laughs> Okay. okay, on that point, we're talking, <laughs> excuse me, I, I hate to get personal here, but well, we are talking, okay, let's, no, let's okay. Not, no, not, personal. Not, pers not personal, <laughs> personal in a general way. We are talking about a program, bilingual education, that has been imposed in the United States and supported for decades by the educational theoretical establishment and endless numbers of professors of education all believe in bilingual education. In fact, I would argue that the number of academics professors of education who support bilingual education outnumbers those who oppose bilingual education by probably about a thousand to one. If you go to all the professors of bilingual education and you ask them whether bilingual education works, they will say, of course it works. I'm a professor of bilingual education. I believe in bilingual education. I've always believed in bilingual education. Unfortunately, the reality is contrary. The analysis the Mercury News did was not a complex type of analysis. If you simply look at the test scores, of those students in districts that kept their bilingual programs statewide, and you compare it to the test scores of those students in districts that got rid of their bilingual programs, you see a gigantic difference across the state of California and a million students. Reality trumps theory. And to be honest, in past decades, in past eras, there were many professors of theoretical physics who were totally wrong. They believed in nonsense. And after a while, they all died off and a new generation of professors arose that believed in reality. What we are seeing now is the collapse of a gigantic group of theorists who believed in bilingual education for 30 years, and because of that belief, and because of that advocacy, and because of those books there, destroyed the lives of millions upon millions of students in America during that period. That is what the history books will write. Hey, Ron, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> How, have we crippled the students who have come up in the last 30 years? Have we crippled, have we crippled the students who have come up in the last 30 years? Of course not. Uh, once again, I am not defending poor educational programs. I cannot defend poor bilingual programs, and I certainly cannot defend poor immersion programs. And they're out there on both sides. Good programs trump pro program quality trumps program type. I, I'm quite sure that's true. So it, of course, if, if uh, a school district determines that it's going to put a lot of energy into improving its reading instruction, improving its math instruction, uh, and teaching its children English, it can get improved outcomes. And if it, it can choose to do that with a, a structured immersion program, or it can choose to do that with a bilingual program. The fact of the matter is that the program quality is very important. But I um, could mention dozens of students I know, for example, who've gotten into Harvard, who are products of bilingual programs. <laughs> these, these are people whose lives have been enhanced by bilingual programs. I could take you down the street and show you two-way bilingual programs where not only Spanish-speaking children, but English-speaking children feel their lives are being enhanced by the opportunity to develop bilingual skills from kindergarten on through, through elementary school. The notion that bilingual education, that good bilingual education is bad for children, is simply nonsense. It's, is it a district's commitment to bilingual, and, and bilingual can mean a lot of things, whether it, it's immersion or the traditional bilingual. Is it the district's commitment to what you do with students who don't speak English as a first language that makes the biggest difference? I would argue, again, very simply and straightforwardly, bilingual education has never worked anywhere in America on a large scale in 30 years. You can find, with any sort of theory, you can always find a few isolated cases where it might work under ideal laboratory conditions. You can find a classroom where it works. You might be able to find a school where it works. Allegedly, you might be able to find a very small school district where it works. But there has been no large-scale example anywhere in America in 30 years where bilingual programs work. 
And I've, again, repeatedly asked the advocates of bilingual education to point to any large school district anywhere in America that they can cite as a successful example of implementing their programs, and they can't think of one. Now, if something has never worked anywhere on a large scale in 30 years, maybe it just doesn't work. And it is true that you can find dozens of students, as Professor Snow cited, who benefited tremendously from these bilingual programs. I believe that. But I think you can find dozens of millions of students who were hurt by these bilingual programs, and you have to go with the numbers. In the state of California, again, those school districts that were cited by bilingual advocates as having some of the best bilingual programs, like VISTA, that were doing everything right, they showed virtually no gain in test scores in the period following the initiative, with the contrast being those districts that got rid of their bilingual programs showed enormous improvement. And let, let's look at other examples. Everybody knows that a lot of Latino immigrant students do a lot better in the Catholic schools than they do in the public schools. Many of them, in fact, if they were given the opportunity, would probably rather send their children to Catholic schools, parochial schools, rather than the public schools. Catholic schools do not use bilingual education. The students are taught English right away. Now, if these same immigrant students do so much better in Catholic school than they do in public school without bilingual programs, couldn't part of the reason be that they're being taught English rather than being taught Spanish? And again, when we're talking about theories, anybody here who believes in this audience, anybody who believes in this audience, that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language, should vote against our initiative because that is the basis of these bilingual programs, which is utter nonsense. I really think we're talking about something where these bizarre theories have been created by a lot of ivory tower academics for 30 years that crippled the education of millions of students around the United States and now are collapsing under their own weight. And the question I have for Professor Snow is, what if your theories are wrong? What if they're actually wrong? Have you ever thought about that and what happened, has happened to all these millions of students for all these years if those four books there or five books there are actually wrong? What, what do you think is in these five books? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of arguments saying bilingual education works. That's exactly what's not in these okay. books. What is in these books is data about things like how long uh, it takes under various conditions to learn a second language. How long do you think it takes a young child to learn English? at five years old? I think to learn the first word could take half an hour. I think to, uh, that if a, a child in, a, in an immersion classroom is learning five words of English a day, that's probably pretty good. I think by the end of a year, the child could know a thousand words of English, could have a wonderful conversation with an avuncular adult who comes in and says things like, what's your name and where do you live and what kind of games do you play? I think, however, that at the end of one year, that child will not be sufficiently proficient in English to have an easy time learning how to read in English. I think that there is a very high risk of trying to teach children to read in languages they do not speak well. And reading is the ultimate test. If children are not learning to read well, school is not doing its best by them. That's an excellent statement of the case for bilingual education and the theory behind it. The theory behind it is that it's wrong to teach children English until you've spent sometimes years teaching them in Spanish, including read and writing in Spanish. I now, do. Okay, sure. Exactly. Now, oh, I, th audience, I, sure. I think our audience Perfect. really wants exactly. to chime in here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I want to do, it's going to be complicated because I know a lot of you want to ask both of our panelists questions. I'm going to take a question from here, a question from the center, and then a question. Well, maybe I'll start on this end. I'll, I'll defer to our, our friend John Silber, who was a former. Uh, Please be, as, 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 before you start, as we ask our panelists questions, I would ask that you be respectful of everyone in the room. Everyone has a different opinion, and please respect those opinions. <laughs> and, and by not doing, not chiming in too loudly, it will give more people an opportunity to ask questions and not make statements. 